Take your Bibles and open them to uh, Mark chapter number two. Mark chapter number two. I'm going to talk today about healing. Healing. Church is not simply a gathering together of all the people that are healthy, but we're also a hospital for the sick and the hurting. So today we're going to look at one of my favorite stories in all the Bible. I wish I was there that day. It's just an amazing, amazing story. So if you would, stand with me in honor of reading God's Word, Gospel of Mark, chapter number 2. We'll begin reading in verse number 1. So the clock doesn't work, huh? Time stands still. When I preach, time stands still. Is that right? So I can preach for 45 minutes and it'll seem like one minute. Okay. Oh, you set your alarm. <laughs> Thank you, Brother Deacon. <laughs> let's, let's look in verse number one. And again, he entered Capernaum after some days, and it was heard that he was in the house. Immediately, many gathered together so that there was no longer room to receive them, not even at the, uh, near the door. And he preached the word to them. Then they came to him bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. And when they could not come near be him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your, your sins are forgiven you. Some of the scribes were sitting there and reason in their hearts. Why, why does this man speak blasphemy like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they reasoned thus within themselves, he said to them, why do you reason about these things in your heart? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, arise, take up your bed and walk, but that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. Immediately he arose, took up the bed, went out in the presence of them all, so that all were amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. Let's pray. So Lord, uh, it is a pleasure to be uh, in this place, it is a pleasure to be with your people. It is so encouraging to see the smiles in their face and hear how they express their love for you. Father, I, I thank you for Sundays. I thank you for uh, your spirit to be with us. And I pray that in the next few moments that you would take your word. You are the Alpha and the Omega. John 1.1 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So Jesus, preach yourself to these people today. There are many people who are hurting. There are many people who are sick. Some are walking around with things that they don't even realize. Some know those things, and they seem like they're so big and so powerful in their life. But Lord, we know that Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Lord, I like it when you put us in a position, in a place where we're not going to survive except by you. So Lord, uh, let us see Jesus today. Let us hear from Christ and Christ alone. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated wasn't long ago we were in chapter 1 and we were looking in verse 38 where it says, let us go into the next town that I may preach there also. Now that what had happened was Jesus had been doing some amazing things and, and people were being uh, healed, people were being touched, and, and the entire city went to him because they just were overly blessed and just could not get enough. They were hungry, hungry, hungry for a bite of the bread of life. And so he said, no, no, after praying, he said, we've got to go to the other cities too. 
so that they can they can hear about the Son of Man as well. So then we get here and we get back to verse 1, and he comes back to Capernaum after some days. We don't know how long exactly that was, but it could have been weeks. It could have most likely months, maybe even a half a year. And now he's coming back to his home base, and word gets out. I don't know how word gets out, but it always does, doesn't it? And I like that phrase. I love that phrase. And it was heard that he was in the house. When Jesus shows up, when Jesus shows out, it does a stirring, wonderful, amazing thing. When Jesus is there to bless, all the people are happy. When Jesus is there to encourage and let them know that God is well and sits on the throne and he loves with an amazing, overwhelming love. Oh, when we get a, just a taste of him, nothing else will do. So when they hear he's back, it was heard that he was in the house. They did not ask anything else. They just said, I'm going where he is. So verse 2 says, I, I believe this is one of Mark's favorite words. So he pins it down. Look what it says in verse 2. Immediately. Y'all like that word? Soon as they heard, they said, I got to go. I want to be where he's at. I want to be close to the fire. I want to feel all the love that God has there. So it says, it says uh, many gathered together so that there was no longer room to receive them, not even near the door. Most likely what happened was they came back to the place that they were staying when they left the town. That's Peter's house. Remember when he was there and, and Peter's mother-in-law was sick and he went and she had the high fever and he just took her by the hand and lifted her up and the fever immediately left, right? When Jesus shows up, he comes to show and bless with kindness and goodness. He makes our life better. It is sweet to be with Jesus when he is doing these amazing and wonderful things. So when word gets out, all came. And, and some were just curious. Some wanted, it says here that there's some scribes that show up and they got in the house. That means they had to leave early. They wanted a front row seat. Now, we don't know all of the reasons why they came. That's really not important. We'll hear some of the questions that they had in just a little bit. Maybe they just wanted to know who is this person? I understand amazing things are happening. You know, curiosity is a wonderful thing. You know, curiosity means that you've got questions. You want to know. If we heard today that if you went down Jesse Jewell and, and they've just, somebody gave them some money and they're going to give away free brand new vehicles, do you think there'd be a crowd? Y'all think there's traffic now. You think they'd all, all show up over there to find it? Can I get in line? Would you, would you get there as quickly as possible? Some of y'all don't want a new car. Curiosity would be there, wouldn't it? The scribes had some questions. Who is this man? Why doesn't he follow us? Is it real? Or not? Is Jesus real? Some people might want to know. So they may have questions. They may come seeking answers. So that people started to gather in and the crowd was there in an amazing way to the point that the house is full, the doorways are full, people are looking in the windows, people are standing outside just so they can hear a word. Wouldn't it be so great? Now, I've heard these stories. I've just never experienced it. When the, when the house got so full and people were in the doorways, I've heard that they would stand outside and, and, and just open the windows up where people could hear the word. Wouldn't it be great if my deacons came and said, uh, Pastor, we've got to do something. There's, a, there's so many people outside. The parking lot is full. We're going to have to get these stained glass windows. By the way, 
we'd have to get the nails out of them, I'm afraid. And we'd have to open them things up. Craig could open them up, couldn't you? Push them things up just so people outside could hear the Word of God. We got room in here today. I pray that Jesus shows up. Because if Jesus shows up, word will get out. Because there's plenty of hurting people in the world. There's plenty of people searching for answers. And they're looking in many of them in all the wrong places. What it says here in verse 2, that when they got there, there was no room to receive and not even near the door. And he preached the word to them. There's two words here for the word preach. One is to herald. It means to bring it aloud. When you come up in the pulpit and everybody's gathered together, preach the word. Preach it loud. Preach it strong. Let everyone hear. Tell them the good news. But there's also another word for preach. To gently share. Now, our church does both. We gather together and, 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 and where everybody can be in one place at one time and we open the Word of God and I'll do my very best to get out of the way, but I'll preach the Word with strength and faith, with caring, with love, but with the authority that the Word has. But we also have small groups as well. And, and y'all might not know this, but I don't yell at them. I don't, I don't talk to them the way I talk to y'all. But the word is to gently share. Kenneth Wiest, when he explains this word, he brings up the song, In the Garden. How many of y'all know the song, In the Garden? I come to the garden alone, right? But that second verse says, uh, He speaks, and the sound of His voice is so sweet, the birds hush their singing. Y'all know that voice as well? Y'all know the, the whisper? Y'all know the, the word when you just get overcome with the love of God and it's just so tender, the sweetness to your heart? It, it, it play, he, he takes the, the harp of our heart and he begins to gently play the, into our soul the love that he has for us. He whispers his love and his truth to us. This is the second word. And this is the word that he's using then. When he's got the crowd there, he's not standing up and preaching like he did when he spoke to the 5,000. No, 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 no. He's gently sharing of the care of his father. Now, Pete, the word has gotten out and people are coming. And look what it says in verse 3. Then they came to him. Who is the they? Some good folks. They came because they came on mission. And it says here that they were bringing a person who was a paralytic, and they're carrying him by four men. So that these four that are there, they've got a friend. What have they heard? It doesn't matter your disease. It doesn't matter your illness. It doesn't matter your hurt. Jesus makes the pains go away. So they have a friend that they've known for some time, and they go to him because he does not have an ability to get to where Jesus is. He's paralyzed. He can't move. He can't walk. He doesn't have an ability, but they love him. They care for him. So they went to get him, and they bore him up. Most likely a mat. And they, there was four of them, so there's four corners of it. So they're picking him up and bearing the load. Isn't that a wonderful picture? Somebody needs Jesus. But somebody can't find their way to Jesus. So they need somebody else who loves them to come and take them to where Jesus is. Is that not the job of the church? Is that not our joy? Y'all know anybody that's hurting? Y'all know anybody that needs peace? Y'all know anybody that has questions? You know anybody that needs just one touch will do? I think we do. Matter of fact, we'll love them in our way. We'll be kind to them. We'll talk to them about the weather. We'll talk to them about if the Braves are going to make the playoffs. 
We're going to talk to them about politics. All y'all talk about is politics. Bunch of heathens. I'm just kidding. Seems like there's a buzz. We got an election coming up. Mm, I don't know. We can talk about anything, can't we? But the thing that they need the most, by the way, and we know who has the answers. We may invite them to a concert at the school. We may invite them to a picnic at the park. We may invite them to anything else. And all those things are good. But do we invite them to the place where the greatest good occurs? Where they might find Christ. I love these four. They didn't care. They had a friend. Their friend needed Jesus. So look what it says here. They're bringing him here. What did they find? Verse 4 says, when they could not come near because of the crowd. Oh, surely this group would be so kind that they would just get out of the way because they could see the need of that person and they would just part the Red Sea and just let this person come through so they could find their needs met in Jesus. You think they said, can we come through? Maybe they got this look. I was here first. You're sitting in my seat. <clears throat> I, I, I was reading a book. I gave the book to Rick, and it's, it's a small book. I, I, I can read it in 45 minutes. And, and, I, and I read the book, and, I, I, and it talked about how, and I wouldn't believe this, but they said that people come to church, and other people will come up to them and say, you're in my seat. Hold on, I must have missed that meeting. Do we have assigned seats? Well, I'm looking out here and you're all sitting in the same place? I must have missed that meeting. I mean, you've got that cushion in that pew fit just right for you, right? We are creatures of habit, aren't we? Do we ever put ourselves first? It's just human nature, isn't it? Well, they've got a friend. Their friend needs Jesus. They probably said, can we come through? And they got that look. They weren't welcomed in. They could not come near him. So it says, they uncovered the roof where he was. Hold on. They did what? I would have liked to have been there when they, had, when they began the discussion. We, what are we going to do now? I don't know. I tell you what, let's walk up the stairs on the outside of the house. We'll dig up the roof and we'll just let him down the roof. And another person says, do what? We're going to do what? And another person says, why not? We face obstacles. Y'all know what I mean? And the obstacles always look huge. They did not say, well, let's just go home. Can't go, can't help. Let's just take him. Maybe we'll, maybe another day. They didn't come and say, no, I don't think we can. They said, this man needs Jesus. We'll make a way. Faith is seeing a way when it doesn't look like there is a way. Faith is believing that if you go forward, God will make a way. One of the men that is in heaven that I learned a lot from, most of y'all know him and you've learned a lot from him too. He was the pastor at First Baptist Church, Atlanta. He was, his name was Charles Stanley. He, he, as a young boy, would go to see his grandparents in the summertime. And I have heard Charles Stanley in my presence say this in meetings more than once. He went to see his grandfather, and his grandfather told him, said, Charles, if God tells you to go run through that wall, you run. It's God's responsibility to make a hole. How many of us are waiting for God to make the hole? Then we'll run. God to make a way. 
put a big bright light on it and say, please come. And then I'll, no, we just say, I don't think we can do that. Now, the tragic thing is, is that Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6 says, I hope you hear this, the only way that we please God is by faith. Now, if you want to be a God pleaser, you're going to have to get beyond the comprehension of your understanding, and you're going to have to have an understanding that there is a great big God who can. And his desire is to see that you would so follow him that you would say, he'll make a way. The answer is already yes. So what they did was they carried that man up on top of the roof. Now the roof were, was a flat roof in those homes in that day. And they didn't leak. How did they not leak? Have y'all ever seen a business that had r rubber roofs, flat roofs, and there's always a five-gallon bucket around, can I get a witness, where they're catching the water that comes through. Seems like, right? Well, they would have the, 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 slat, the, the, the poles there, the slats in the roof, and they would put rock and stone on top mixed with mortar, plaster, you could say, and then they would add to it ash, sand, dirt, and it would be put in levels. So what they had to do was to go up there on that flat roof and dig it up. So they're digging a roof. They're making a hole. They're throwing rocks out of the way. This is dirty, nasty work. By the way, work that when the person built the house, they hoped that it would never happen. Somebody's destroying their house. I got another word for you. They didn't ask permission. How rude. Well, there was something that was pushing them. It was love. Luke chapter 5 in this, talks about this particular thing, and it says, and they let him down through the slats. This is not a trap door. Oh, no, no. They dug it up. They're kicking at it up there. They're trying to knock it. I can just hear the racket and people are going, what in the world's going on? And then a foot comes through the roof. And they see these people up there. Do you think that got everybody's attention? Jesus is speaking in a tender, kind voice and they're getting distracted, kind of like y'all do when I preach. You get at your phone. Right, And you're not searching for words in the Greek. I know what you're doing. You're on Facebook. We get distracted all of a sudden. And they look up there and they see as it, I like this, as it unfolds. Now, I don't know. If this is Peter's house, he's probably having a fit. Quit it! Stop! What are you doing? Right? Somebody comes up to your house and they start knocking out windows to let to get into your house. Uh, most of the time, y'all pull a gun on them. You you would put a gun on them and say, "Don't move," and then call nine one one. You wouldn't like it, but Jesus is smiling. I wonder the things that we do. Are they putting a smile on others' face, or are they putting a smile on God's face? You know why I like this story? It is so abstract. It is so crazy. If you told me this story and told me that it was a true story, I'd have said, You're, that, that's idiotic. That's, that's crazy. Nobody would do this. There was something. There was something. It was a faith thing. So you know what? The roof opens up. And when Jesus saw their faith. Look in verse 5. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, your sons, your sins, son, your sins are forgiven you. The, the word son there is a very tender word. What we sometimes say, hey, my friend. But he, he says, your sins are forgiven. Now, hold on. Those scribes over here, 
the people who know the Word of God, we've got their attention now. And they're saying, what did he say? Verse 6, some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their heart, why does this man blaspheme like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Who can forgive sins but God alone? You know what? They were right. Nobody can forgive. Y'all can't forgive sins, but Jesus can. You're not qualified. You're not qualified, but he is. Let me say it this way. You can forgive what they've done to you because of what God's forgiveness has done for you. What God has done for you, you do for others. As God forgave you, you forgive others. As God loves you, you love others in that way. So he said, son, your, your sins are forgiven. The scribes are saying, hey, no, 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 that's blasphemy. Once again, Mark uses that word, but immediately. Jesus knew what was going on in their heart and in their thoughts. They're, they're reasoning, saying, and so he says to them, why do you reason about these things in your heart? Which is the easiest thing to say? To say to this man who's paralyzed, your sins are forgiven you, or to say to him, arise, take up your bed and walk. I mean, it's easy to just use words. If you don't have the power behind it, they're just words. If I looked at you and said, be blessed, that's just words. But if, if, if the blessing comes with it, the power comes with it, the life change comes with it, the healing comes with it. Well, but that you may know that the Son of Man, in the Gospels, this term, Jesus uses this term, it is recorded over 80 times. I'm telling you, the Son of God is the child of God. And he is down here, not simply as the Son of God, but he's the Son of Man. He is the Messiah, the Christ, God's anointed one. But so that you will know that the Son of Man has power on the earth to forgive sins, he said to this paralytic, I say to you, arise. Now, there's much speculation on this. But this man, most likely, he was paralyzed because of something that he had done. His sin, his life. Now, everybody sins. Can I get an amen? I was talking to somebody, is it Friday? And uh, I told him, I said, my wife and I just had a fight. <gasps> they couldn't believe it. How many of y'all believe Lynn and I had a fight? Some of y'all don't believe it, do you? Brother Brian would never have a fight with his wife. It lasted about five minutes. Well, actually, it's lasted about 36 years now, but no, <laughs> I'm just... I, we're not going to talk about that one. But all of us are not perfect. Any of you ever say the wrong word? I don't mean cussing. I hope y'all pass that. If you're not, start there. Get that right with God. Are you always encouraging in Walmart? In the parking lot at Walmart? Any of y'all perfect? How many of y'all think you're perfect? How many of you know that you're not perfect, but you act like you are? I'm just asking. Look, something had happened in this man's life. I don't know what it was. But for Jesus to bring it in in this certain way, he didn't look at him and say, hey, my friend. He said, son, first thing he said to him, your sins are forgiven. What was it that he needed? He needed Christ in his life. And for Christ to be in your life, God can't have a relationship with sin. So sin needs to be forgiven. It needs to be redeemed. Your heart that is wicked beyond measure needs to be made new. It's not just the physical things. 
How many of you know that sick people get sick again? How many of you know that good days are great, bad days are worse? There's an ebb and flow to life. But how many of you know that one day you're going to say goodbye to this world? And then the good stuff really begins if you know Christ. If you've had a heart that's been redeemed. I so look forward to being in the presence of the glory of God. Matter of fact, when I get up on Sunday morning, my hope stream is I'm going to come to a place where I will be in the very presence of the glory of God. I yearn for that. Sometimes I grab my Bible. I woke up early this morning. My Bible was in the living room, sitting beside the chair that I sat in. I turned on the little uh, light that's on the, uh, beside my chair, and I picked up my Bible. And I spent some time in God's Word, and I just prayed. and I felt like I needed to be with Him before I came to be with y'all. I wanted to be in His presence before I was in your presence. I wanted my heart to be filled, and I didn't want to come to church so that my heart would be filled. I wanted to be forgiven even though I was forgiven when I was 10 years old. I wanted to be freshly touched with the love and the forgiveness of God. And when Jesus said to this paralytic, your sins are forgiven you. Now, because of that, arise. Take up your bed and get out of here. Go on. Live your life. He gave to that person the ability to do what he could not do. He could do nothing. He was paralyzed. For those of you who have very theological standpoints on this, did he pray a prayer first? No. Did he repent? I don't know. It doesn't say anything about that. Did he believe? His friends believed because Jesus looked past this man and saw the faith of his friends. And because of the faith that they had for him, he could say to him, your sins are forgiven. Now get up in health. Get up and you can live your life. If I was there, I would have said, if I was Jesus, which praise God I'm not, but I would have said to him, get up and walk and follow me until I take you home. But until then, you go to your home. He had a home. They watched a paralyzed man leave. They saw a new man walk back. Old things are passed away. All things become brand new. Whole. Complete. It was an invitation. When he said to this man, I say to you, arise, take up your bed and go to your house. Once again, there's that word that Mark likes. Immediately, it says in verse 12, he arose, took up the bed, went out in the presence of them all so that all were amazed and glorified God saying, we never saw anything like this. He didn't have a way in, but ever after a touch from God, those people just got out of the way and they watched a living miracle walk by them at the door. You know, the greatest advertisement for Jesus is a walking miracle in you. You're the advertisement. You're the evidence that He's alive and well. It doesn't matter the obstacles. Jesus will make a way. It doesn't matter how difficult. I just want to know, is the church going to act like the scribes, like the others that were outside blocking the way to Jesus? Or is the church going to act like the four bringing someone to Jesus? I don't know what was going on in that man's mind when he was being toted to Jesus, but I can guarantee you he left with a smile because he had been changed by Jesus. Oh, what God can do. Y'all believe that? Y'all believe God's still in the change in life business? 
Diane, I saw you come in this morning. My heart leaped. I went up to her. For some reason, she's not in my phone. I, I, I was going to text her yesterday, call her yesterday, and she wasn't in my phone. So maybe you're here because the Lord just wanted me to look at that living miracle walking right in front of us. Um, have you been tired? A little bit of weary? Has Jesus encouraged you? Has he encouraged you? You know, we can get up, give up, or we can get up and get going. Aren't we supposed to just keep moving forward? Aren't we supposed to trust Him? Aren't we supposed to love Him? How many of you know what God's going to do? One day I know what's going to happen. The trumpet's going to blow and I'm going to be out of this place. Or my heart's going to stop and I'll get there quicker. I don't care. Are y'all ready? I hope you are. I don't know if all of you are. Heaven's going to be fun. And I don't want you to miss it. How many of y'all know somebody that doesn't know Jesus? It's not going to be fun for them. Let the church be the church. Let the people rejoice. For we've settled the question, we've made our choice. Let the anthems ring out. Songs of victory swell. For the church triumphant is alive and well. When they heard that Jesus was in the house. We need to let the Lord fill us up so that he can fill us up.